Hi guys. So I want to spend one more lecture on the complexity of algorithms. It will be a little bit more theoretical, so also you'll see in the homework there's a little bit less <coughs> type of homework that I uh, will assign. <coughs> but before I do that, I just want to do at least one more algorithm, show you how we calculate the complexity. And this is, uh, <coughs> it also allows me to, to uh, explain something what is... There are what, what is called several types of <coughs> algorithms. We have talked about greedy algorithms before already. And so this type here is called brute force. <coughs> and again, it's as with greedy, it was not entirely clean. Um, what makes something greedy? Because remember the scheduling problem, <coughs> there you had different greediness criteria. You could say, I want to be greedy by taking always the first available time slot, but we saw that that was not the optimal one. So there is there are two... two <clears throat> there's a paradigm, like greedy or brute force, I'll explain what that is, and then there is the, an expected outcome, namely an efficient algorithm or an optimal algorithm, an optimal solution. <clears throat> and those things, of course, not always go together. Um, but it's important to, to see a little bit of um, these, these paradigms, these, these um, approaches. And uh, brute force is, as the name almost says it, it's the, the, the simplest you can come, can come up with. For instance, if you have seen a brute force, an example of brute force algorithm, so uh, is a linear search. Because what we do is we go just brute force, we just look at the list one at a time and compare. In other words, nothing sophisticated. Whereas binary search was much more sophisticated. Well, call it, it except it, it expect the expect. Sorry, it uh, assumed that the list was sorted, but then it started doing very clever things with that list. So that's not a brute force. And another example of a brute force is, and a very important problem is, okay, suppose you have a bunch of points here in the plane. Now the, these are points that we, okay, they are set. Uh, cities, for instance, there could be cities, and the question is, um, okay, imagine these are cities, and you want to uh, launch a, um, a, uh, a bus service between two cities, and you're going to start off short, s small, and you say, okay, I'm going to just take the shortest of the two cities that are close to each other that, that need a bus service, um, so that that reduces my cost, my, my, my gas that I have to do and other things. So I'm going to use the shortest point. So what is the, the, the shortest distance, the, the two points that are closest, so the closest point problem? Closest, uh, closest pair of points, perhaps. Are we looking for two? And in the... I mean, you, you, if there's not too many, we see just visually what this would be. But again, always think about these things. What the examples that we give are kind of uh, not honest in the sense that they're way too small. And so you have to imagine this is really the whole map of the whole of US, with where you take all the cities of at least let's say fifty thousand people. You you say okay, those only among between those I want to have a, um, a bus service. And then you look for the two, the two that are closest to each other. And that's way much more uh, to look at, okay? Of course, there are perhaps some obvious things, because some cities are like twin cities and so on. But anyways, you, you, you get the point that this is, cannot be just guessed or looked at. So what is... There are clever algorithms for that, and um, that's in this kit math too. You might see one of those. Uh, what is the brute force would be just simply, okay, take one point, take this another point, and then calculate the distance. That's This is A and this is B, the distance between the two points, and now look for, do this for all possible pairs, and take the smallest one. That is as brute force as you can be, okay? So... Um, so we have how would this the, the the procedure look like? So let me just quickly give the I'm on the pseudocode for this the procedure. I'm just taking that from the book. Uh, closest pair, and so we have points P1, P2, 
and these points are given to us by coordinates, x and y coordinates. Okay, so perhaps it's we should should list it that way. That's also how the book does it. So let me do that. So we have the points with coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on up to xn, ym. So these are points in the plane. Okay, this is a little bit, uh, Jesus. Okay, so what you do is, um, well, you say, let's, let's, this is a bit weird thing. Let me write it down. I'm going to calculate the minimal distance, okay? And, um, yeah. I have to keep track of the smallest distance. Now, the question is not to give the smallest distance. The question is to give the smallest pair. So I have to actually keep track of these points. So, But I'm going to say, okay, the smallest distance is infinity. Why do I do this? Because um, I want to make sure that the number that I start with minimum is always bigger than anything I will do later on, so that it will, will be... Um, See, if I would take the minimum is, let's say, 100 miles, and I happen to have two points that, that, that the list consists only of two points and they are more than 100 miles apart, then, then there's a problem. Then it will not find those two points because it says, oh, the minimum distance was supposed to be less than 100 and these two are more than 100, so it doesn't work. So I have to take something that is so big that it never will interfere. And then what I do is simply I loop to the list of the points. So for I going from 1 well, actually, uh, I don't know why they do from 2 to n. Okay, I'm going to make it a little bit simpler than the book does, because we are interested in, in complexity plus brute force. I'm going to do it as brute force as it can be. So I'm going to go to all points for i going from 1 to n. And then, um, then I go for. I'm gonna go to the second list of to again. To n oh to n sorry that has to be in regular. So the first i is chooses the first point. The j will take track of the second point. Now of course I cannot take two the same. Okay, so um, sorry. I need this. This is I'm gonna move this thing a little bit out of the way. I'll, this is something for later. Um, so what I then do is, if, if i is different from j, okay, sorry, and if, then if has to be uh, done in, it's, it's part of the pseudocode, so if i is not j, I have to exclude that part, and the distance, what's the distance, now, what's the distance formula, if this is x, y, x1, y1, and this is x2, y2, then the distance is given by the radical of x2 minus x1 squared plus x2 minus uh, y2 minus y1 squared. That's the distance formula, if you still remember that. Now, um, sometimes it's a bit annoying to keep this radical, and the book did do away with it, because if the, the, the square root is as small as possible, then the square then we can square everything and get rid of the square roots and then also look for the smallest of that. But let's not do that. So, and if the distance, so this this square root, xi minus xj square plus uh, yi minus yj square, doesn't make, matter in which order I do this because I'm, I'm squaring it anyway, uh, is less than the minimum distance. So I found something that is smaller than what I currently thought was the smallest one. Okay, and this will happen the very first time, right? Well, let's see. Well, let's write down what it happens. What do we do then? Then, well, then we keep track of i and j. So then we keep i and j. Then um, min. We the, well, the minimum of course now changes because now the minimum becomes this new minimum. Minimum will be this number. I'm gonna copy it again, and the closest pair. will be i, j. Okay, I'm just going to write the indices rather than, than the pairs themselves.
Okay, so here I just find closest pair. Now let's let's see what happens in the when we start working. Well, I is one, J is one. Now that means I is we are looking at the same point, so we should not do anything here anymore. So this is will not be carried out. So what will happen is nothing, right? This only this is only carried out if if this would be true, but it isn't. So uh, in other words. Uh, this condition is not verified, the if, if then statement is not carried out, and we the loop goes back to its next thing, j is 2. So in the next step, we comparing the first point with the second point, and then, of course, something will happen, because this distance will be less than infinity. And therefore, the, this will come now the actual distance, so min becomes the distance between the first and the second point, and the closest pair will now be the first and second point. But... As I go along, I will find once in a while points that are closer to each other, okay? And that minimum will get for smaller, and then the closest pair will be redefined to be that. That is really as brute force as you can be. As I said, I make it even more brute force than the textbook. It, it, they're, they're being a bit smart to not look at... Because look what I'm doing here. When I'm comparing the first and the second, the first point and the second point, so I is 1 and J is 2, at, at some point, I will do actually the same comparison, namely, if i is 2 and j is 1, I will do the same thing. But, so what? Because the complexity is, as you will see, always the same. So, I now output closest pair, which would be there for... Um, um, so, I guess, yeah, I don't know what, what this is. Ah, closest pair, okay? And that will be two indices that, that indicate the two points. Okay. Now, what's the complexity? I hope this is now something that you can do very quickly. Let's see. Well, each of these things are two step. Each is a step, right? I have to calc... Well, okay, you might say, right, you have to take a square, and then you have to add, and then you take a radical, and they are real numbers. That's a little bit more com concerning, but for us, it's considered as a single step, <coughs> this calculation, and the assignment of closest pair is also. So these are two steps that we, we consider that way. Um, and how many, and then there's the if statement itself that is also comparison there. So all together say, I have, to comp I have to verify this, I have to verify this, two verifications. So all together four, which sounds reasonable. Okay. We know by now that actually this doesn't matter because what is going to happen now, now is how many times do we carry out the loop? Well, this loop will be carried out n times, from j to 1. There's nothing that makes the loop stop, so this will be carried out 4 n times, because each insight will do each time. Each time we do j goes from 1 to n, we have to do 4 operations, so altogether 4 n, and therefore how many operations in here? 4 n square, and there's this one extra thing, so the, the number of steps is 4 n square plus 1. That means that the complexity is O n square. Okay? And as I said, there are uh, algorithms that can do better. But that is in discrete math too, you will see that. So that's just an example of what is called a brute force. We just look at everything and, and, and that they're, they're therefore often not the most um, um, efficient ones. Now, we have come, we have seen a couple of examples and um, not enough to completely see the whole thing, uh, the whole picture yet. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit, a bit more algorithms as we will uh, go to this lecture today. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit of why are we interested in this. And I already hinted at that it has to do, the complexity tells you um, how hard or how many steps does it require to, uh, do, to ca carry out the algorithm. And what does that mean? Well, the steps that it carries out, of course, um, what we're really interested in is not so much so many steps, but how much time does it take. Now, that depends, of course, on the, the speed of our processor, the speed of our computer that we run this algorithm on. And um, in the past, computers were much slower than now. So I, I, I think currently the fastest computer, so let me go back in black here. So the supercomputers of today, they can do, and this is quite surprising, quite amazing already what they can do, uh, about, um, and, and prop, no, look, look, I'm taking this from a textbook which is a couple of years old, and it is probably already uh, surpassed now. Uh, things are already faster now, but um, let's say, where is it, sorry, 10 to the minus 11, 
10 to the minus 11 operations. No, 10 to the 11 seconds. Sorry. For one basic step. Let me just call it step. Okay. 10 to the minus 11. That, that, I don't know whether you appreciate how big, how small, sorry, how small this is. Well, what, what does it actually mean? It means IE means in one second can perform 10 to the 11 operations, steps, 10 to the 11. 10 to 11, what does that mean? Well, 1 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I guess if we want to read this a little bit. So this would be a million. This would be a trillion. So we're talking here about a hundred, uh, sorry, million, billion, hundred billion operations in one second. Hundred billion. Right? That is one tenth of a trillion. That is an enormous amount of steps it can do. Um, in one second, okay, and that's, and I mean, there were compu there were times that were computers could do perhaps one operation per second. It's amazing how much more we can do. So this somehow people then forethink, oh, since our computers are so fast, we can calculate everything, and this is where it's wrong, and this is where this complexity comes in. So let me first look again at. Um, uh, sorry, I, let me get this. I want to put this a bit out of the way. Okay, come on, move. Sorry. Uh, okay. So let's look, first look at this guy here that we have. Um, no, let me enlarge it. Okay. Okay, so here we are. Let me move it a little bit. Okay. Why is it so? Oh, because this is the one. Come on. Go down there. Go away. Okay. So here we are. And uh, this one has to be moved. Jesus. Okay. Here we are. So remember, uh, this was a little bit of a, a picture that we have seen before about. Uh, typical functions that are considered in uh, complexity. And I want to draw, draw two dividing lines here, and actually one more important one. But before I do this, perhaps let me talk about... Um, no, let, let me draw the dividing line. And the dividing line lies here. Now, it's at this point, it doesn't seem that there's so much difference between what is below and what's b above. But it is now commonly uh, the, the, the state of computer science, and I will say a little bit more about it later, what, what might change, but it's not clear at all that it ever will change, is that everything that is below is tractable, and everything that is above is in, untractable. Untract intractable, sorry. Uh, intractable they use. Both are correct, but no, intractable. Doable, possible. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that if you have a, a, a problem that uses. Uh, a, so, what is, and, and by the way, what is the dividing line called? These are called exponential time or wars. This is exponential time, like you see here, 2 to the n. Could also be an other exponential function. And remember, these exponential functions, they even go... Um, where is my... This, this are, notice that this is a logarithmic scale. So this is actually a bit of a, of a false pre, uh, image. It looks like this is a straight line, but because it's a logarithmic scale, that is not at all the case. But, but if, I, if we don't do a logarithmic scale, you don't even see the 2 to the n anymore. Okay? But then you would have 2, 3 to the n, and so on. You have all these... Uh, logarithms, uh, sorry, exponentials that go up there, that even higher. So this is called exponential or worse 
uh, scale, and the one below it is called polynomial, or less than polynomial. Uh, you see here, this is polynomial, there would be at another dividing line if you want here, right? Uh, log n is considered even way less than it, and we will uh, evaluate this a little bit. So logarithmic is, this is sometimes a logarithmic time, logarithmic, okay? And then this is, then we have sometimes names, like this is linear time, this is called, uh, what is it called? Uh, linear arithmetic, lin linear rhythmic, linear rhythmic. I've never heard that word, but the, the, the book, that book said, I'm not a computer science specialist, so what do I know? Okay, but, so these are, of course, this is considered better than that, and this is considered better than that, and so on, but somehow they all fall into what we call tractable, okay? And uh, I will argue a little bit later why this is considered tractable. Uh, of course, this is n squared, but this, there would be also an n cube here, right? So the more, a few more would be here, would be n cube, and here would be perhaps n to the tenth. So the power, of course, the higher the power, the worse that it is, but it is still considered tractable. Uh, oh, sorry, it should have been, yeah, my dividing line, yeah, Okay, let me re redraw my dividing line, because now it looks like, so I, I'll do it here with um, in purple. So the dividing line is really here. This is dividing line. Yeah, I'm sorry. No. So that's the dividing line. Everything that is exponential is above, and everything below it is polynomial, okay? So, all right, so what does this now uh, mean? Is Well, let's see why is this so different. And now I want to look at this second chart here, that, this chart here that we have. Okay, uh, let me enlarge this a little bit, okay. And here you see a little bit the effect of the size. So the size, remember, is the size of the input is very often, uh, we often use the word, the letter N for it, but what it is, is the, the size of, the, of the, the number of input, like here the number of points, the number of things in the list. Sometimes when we work with, we will later see that there are other problems that involve just one number, and it's the size of that number. There are, you could here question it, if you say, okay, the number of points, or, or the number of, of numbers in a list, that's the size, that's the n. Now, these numbers themselves could be really big, and the bigger the numbers, perhaps the, the worse things are. Okay, so but there is, we are just scratching the surface of, of this problem, right? But So we a bit vague and say n is the, the size of our input, and then uh, we have the outputs. And so the output, let's say, um, the output is given by these complexities. Okay. So now we have this computer, this supercomputer that I um, imagine. If, by the way, our laptops and so are, uh, I think, about a hundred or thousand times less fast. So don't don't start now thinking that you have this this fast um, um, computer. But so this is the speed that it has, and it has to carry out say. Uh, calculations of this size. So let's look at the first line. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll make the line a little bit um, that you can follow me. Um, so this, the first one here. Okay, let's look at this line. So if we have an input size 10, how long does it take depending on the, whether this is the complexity, this, this, or this, this, or this. Now, be careful. Remember, this is complexity, and it is really only, uh, if we say complexity, let's say n square then it could actually be that the number of steps was something like, you see here, uh, where was it, 4n squared plus 1. So there is a constant involved. Therefore, uh, when I say, when they say this is the number of, that's the time that it takes, here you see the, the time it takes to do all these operations, and you see they're all very, very, less than a second. Each of these things depend, no, no matter what, um, how many steps, how, how bad the complexity is, it is always um, less than a second, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's increase the, the, the size of the problem by instead of 10, 10 square, which is still not big. We, we really have to think about sizes of 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, and so on. 
but okay so let's let's say all right so what what about the next size so 10 square here notice that complexity factorial which we don't talk about much so i i'll, I'll make my dividing line again the dividing line of course is now here and you will see much better why this is a dividing line. I should perhaps should have waited. Let me not draw the dividing line let and then let you suggest the dividing line. Well, you saw it now, but okay. Notice that uh, what a, a, a very unexpected thing is happening here. 10 square, 100. Ha! 100. No biggie. Right, okay. If I do this, like say, even quadratic time, it takes me... Um, 10 millionth of a second nothing exponential oh dear 10 to the 11th years not seconds years uh, how old is the universe uh, let me google that for you how old the universe is for the moment so of the universe I used to know this but I'm not very um, age of the universe it is currently uh, uh, about uh, 13 billion billion years old so billion is oh billion 13 billion so we 13 times what is a billion that is 10 to the ninth so we are talking here about 100 times longer than the universe has existed. And that is only size 100. That's ridiculous, right? Now what happens with size 1000? Let's see how dramatic it even becomes then. In a 1000, and, and you might say, okay, what does the star mean? And, and let me explain the star in the next one. And factorial, right? It explains. This means longer than ever we estimate the universe will last. Uh, I think they call they say here. Um, let me go, so double check here what the textbook. It, it says it. Uh, sorry. This is a chart from the textbook, by the way. So um, um, this is chart table two. I'm sorry. I have to look table two. Uh, everything that is more than 10 to the 100 years which is as I said longer than we believe the universe will ever exist remember we are only 10 to the 9th at the moment so that the previous thing was already horrendous but this is so takes so long and this is what 10 to the 3rd what is that a thousand that's nothing okay so exponential time already blows up and uh, is it then perhaps as bad with the others no look with a thousand everything is still with, within a second so let's jump to the biggest that the table gives us so let me get rid of this here and jump to this what's the biggest the table ever gives us the worst case with a million and that's quadratic time it only gives quadratic time is uh 0.17 of a minute the, the pause between the, my previous sentence and my next sentence was longer. So, it was nothing, right? Yet, the stars here are really getting worse and worse on the, the, the other side and the, the exponential side. So, I hope now that this dividing line is extremely clear now to you. Okay? All right. So, uh, yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to say about that. And now I want to talk about something that is, um, as I said, rather, um, and, and uh, sorry, let me one more time reiterate. Is I hope it's now clear that this is called, why this is called tractable and why this is considered intract untractable or intractable. Okay. And we will eventually get to the point that we're going to use intractable problems to cryptography. The idea is this, if the problem is intractable, if we can use a, an intractable problem to encode, encrypt something, then nobody can break that code because it's intractable. 
Now, of course, there is a caveat, because if I encode something and I make it intractable to decode, what's the point? Who is going to be able, ever be able to look, in, look at it? So we're going to have to be uh, clever in the sense we're going to devise an algorithm that is intractable if you're missing a certain piece of information. But if you have that piece of information, it becomes tractable. We will see how this will work. This thing, just if you at, at this point you can think of it, can I conceive of how this would work? Right? How could I do this even? But that's what we're gonna that's how it will work. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, so this is a polynomial time, so we call this uh, uh, I wrote it here, polynomial time. This is often also denoted, let me write it here, uh, P. And then there is a, a category of algorithms that are called NP, NP, boldface NP, and that's why I use it, this top face. And this stands for, the P of course stands for polynomial, right? So the, what does the N stand for? But the P stands again for polynomial, non-deterministic. Now this is something that might be strange, and I have to explain it, non-deterministic polynomial time. Time okay, and this was just polynomial time. Okay, what is non-deterministic polynomial time? Mean? So we have a particular problem. Let's say the closest pair problem, and it looks for an, a solution. Now, there is a second thing that you can ask. Once you have the solution, you can say, can I check that it is the solution? Now, to check that, if, if, if this algorithm tells you 0 0.5 and 0.9 are the closest, how can I check this? Not really. I have to basically do the same thing, right? Same calculation. But let's think about a, another problem here. We haven't actually discussed it really, but I'm going to describe it now. Sorry, I'll, I'll move back up. This is sat satisfactability. Or sat uh, uh, let me use a term that the book uses. Uh, they call this um, satisfiability. Hey, where is it? Where did it go? Mm. Okay, let me call it satisfiability, whatever it is called, viability. And it is the following problem. <coughs> it goes back to the very first lectures. You have a, a, a propositional expression, so a propositional expression in the variables P1, P2, P3, up to Pn. So the, the size here is the number of propositional variables. For instance, proposition expression. So example, I'll do one with n is 4. P1 implies P2 and not P2, then P3 and P4. Or P1, then not P2 and P1 and P3, something like that. Okay, so that is, that is the propositional, the big, big, uh, let's call it something else, let's call it Q. Okay, so this is Q. So Q is this expression, and then what we would do is we make a truth table. Let's think about how big is the truth table of, of such an exp expression. So the size of the truth table, remember, was 2 to the power the number of variables. So 2 to the 4, so that would be 16 rows. The truth table, the number of rows, the rows in the truth table. Let me write it like, rows in truth table. I'm talking about the rows here. So how many rows in the truth table? 2 to the 4, 16 rows. So in general, it would be 2 to the n. Okay, ah, that, you see the exponential coming in? Okay, so we start with something that has size n, right? And now, remember what happens. This truth table, what you do? Well, you say, for instance, P1 is 1, P2 is 0, P P3 is 1, and P4 is 0. And then you calculate the truth here. And what does satisfiability mean is, can I find an assignment of the variables? So, so satisfiability, P1 is, say, 1, P2 is 0, P1 is 0, and 
uh, P3 is 0 and P4 is 1. Is this is Q true? Okay, for this particular, so I'm asking for this particular assignment, sorry, uh, for this particular assignment, does Q, Q become true? And if it's not for this one, perhaps for another one. And satisfiability says, well, show me at least that there is one, that there is one possible choice, say this one or perhaps another one, such that this becomes true. That is satisfiability. What this means is if you make the truth table, then in the, in the column that corresponds to this comp rather comp compl uh, complex uh, expression, you have a one. Okay, if that column is not, if the column that is labeled here, by this proposition, go back to your truth tables if you forget now what, how these things work. If there's, a z, if there's a 1 in that column, then that means for that 1, there's an assignment here of the variables P1, P2, and P3, P4. That makes it true. Okay? Remember this from, from before? I, I, I don't want to do an example here. <sighs> That's the satisfiability theorem. So, given expression, is there a possible assignment? And, and if so, please find it for us such that the proposition becomes true. And this is might something that we need. For instance, you remember, these things can be uh, thought of uh, as, as uh, circuits, electrical circuits. And so the question is, I, want, I have this very complicated circuit, and I want to make sure that if I put the right amount of um, ones and zeros on the start, in other words, I put a, a current on this one and no current on that and that and that, am I guaranteed that there will become something out? So is this will this work? That's what 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 the satisfiability asks for. So it's not a a, a stupid question. It it might be very important to check. Okay, and how do we do this? Well, we have seen how to do this. You make the two tables, sixteen rows, and then you find out whether it's there. So when we start with n is four, we needed sixteen calculations. When we start with n uh, propositions, we need two to the n. Uh, rows that have to be calculated. That is the brute force, right? It just I'm just writing down every possibility and check every possibility whether it gives me a truth or false for Q. At the moment, we have no better way of doing this. Amazing that we have not found a better way of doing this. Although we so many problems, we have done so much better, but this one we don't. Okay? So at the moment, the status of this problem is it is an exponential problem. So the, the algorithm that I described so we have to, it's more of the, it's the difference between a problem and an algorithm, right? An algorithm is designed to solve a problem, but perhaps and there may be different algorithms will all be there to solve the same problem, okay? So the algorithm that I just pres prescribed, the truth table algorithm, so the truth table, truth table algorithm, which just picks for each P a value 1 or 0, 1 or 0, 1, 0, 0, and then calculates it by brute force, whether you have a truth or not, and it does it for all possible assignments, has complexity O to the 2n, so this is exponential time, this is called intractable. And remember, right, if size is a 100, if I have 100 truth variables, which in some cases is really not that much, it took longer for the supercomputer, longer than the uh, time that the universe is in existence. So this is that's why it's called intractable. Remind you of that. Okay. Now this is an example of what is called non-deterministic polynomial time. And what does that mean? This means that if I give you a solution, so this means it is polynomial time. Let me write it in words. I I can check check in polynomial time. That a given solution, that a given uh, configuration is a single solution. That is different, right? There's a difference between finding a solution and then checking the solution. Okay, so it is. Let's we just say it's check in polynomial time, whereas this means solve in polynomial time. That's the big difference. So let me uh, under, uh, uh, highlight this. This is solve in polynomial time. This is check in polynomial time. Uh, once you have a solution, you want to check it. Remember, with the two points, pro with the closest space problem, it basically was the same thing because you still had to check every point. But here, no. Because if I tell you, look, 
the algorithm works, works, works longer than the universe and it finally spits out this thing. This is what I think makes the whole thing true. You just do this one check. You you only you don't have to make the full truth table. You take the truth the only row in the truth table you have to make is the one corresponding to these truth values. So it's only well, okay, whatever number of calculations this requires. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight steps. Right? I mean, assuming each of these is a step or whatever you can calculate, it's a fixed number of steps that I do, depending on the size of this particular proposition. No, this proposition is always the same, right? I'm not messing with that one. I have a given one, and I have to just check it for all different po possibilities of P. Okay, so that is an example of an NP problem. Because it is... And, and, and of course, polynomial time problems are NP problems, because if you can solve it in polynomial, you can also check in polynomial time. So, in some sense, what I was saying about this uh, closest points, okay, it takes O n square time to solve it, and it takes S money time to check it, but it is still polynomial time. So, <laughs> right, so this was NP, okay? And many, of course, so that's what I'm saying is, so if we want to write this, think a little bit of this as the problems that are P, that is part of the problems that are NP. Okay, that's, uh, if you think now, okay, so I have to um, modify a little bit what I said. Remember, so, so far I've been talking about an algorithm is polynomial or exponential. What is a problem? A problem is polynomial if it has a polynomial algorithm. The time that a, a, an algorithm can be solved in polynomial time. An al and a problem is NP if there is an algorithm for that problem that uh, can so check a solution in polynomial time. It might be that you have to be clever to even be able to do that, right? I'm not saying that every algorithm is necessarily that you make is necessarily going to be a polynomial time or necessarily going to be um, um, checking in polynomial time, but if you can find one. So this is this very obvious thing that we have, and now is the very big thing. P versus NP. What is P versus NP? You might have heard this in, it is kind of a little bit of a famous problem. It's famous for various reasons because it's a major problem in computer science program. It's an also a problem that if, um, it, it, it also has a, a price solving this. So what is the problem? Let me first say what the problem is. The problem P versus P says, well, are they equal? Is P equal to NP? In other words, if you can check a problem in polynomial, polynomial time, can you then also solve it in polynomial time? Okay? I want to give you the example where we had something. This Remember, this was, um, this was an NP problem. So it is NP, but exponential. Right? It was exponential because it needed exponential. This, the algorithm was exponential, but the problem is NP. <coughs> So what this says is, if this, if P would be NP, if this is true, then it says there must be an algorithm for the satisfiability that, because it's N, because an NP problem is polynomial, that solves this polynomially. So this algorithm that you have by making true table is not the best, op there is a much better one. Okay, now you can say, fine. Even if that, if I know this is true, but it might be so difficult to find that algorithm that all the smartest minds put together never will find that algorithm, that polynomial one that supposedly then exists. And this is where even another thing comes in, and this is gets a little bit. You have to um, pay attention, be be a bit patient because it's not easy all to 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 balance all these ideas against each other. This is what is called an NP complete problem. Uh, of course, the NP-complete problems are part of the NP problem. So we still have uh, this. So let me put it here as, as, as if this is a set, right? So I'm thinking this as a set of all polynomial problems. That means problems that have an algorithm that can be solved in polynomial time. These are all the NP, NP problems. So these are all the problems that can be... Uh, so perhaps I should use a different font for this, right? So... Yeah, right, so let me call this P again, and this NP. So NP is a class of all problems that have an algorithm that is NP. In other words, it's all the, prob all the problems that can be, whose answers can be checked in polynomial time. So we have that 
the NP complete are a subset of the NP, but what are they? And this is the, 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 the thing that you have to understand. It is that it's a class of problems that if, oops, sorry, what is this? Oh, okay. Um, if some NP problem is P, then all RP, or in better or effort or so right. So remember, P is is my my. I should use the bold face here, right? So if some NP problem, so NP, let me call it NP. Therefore, no, no, NP complete. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, okay. No, no. Now, now I got a little bit carried away with my own. Um, it's not some problem. If some NP complete, if some problem from this list, some ah lay. What is this? Some problem that comes from this list, right? If there's an NP complete problem that is happens to be polynomial, then they all are polynomial. And in fact, we know how to do it then. If we know how to do one, do we know how to do all of them? And therefore, in particular, if we can do one, so if some of them, if one of these is polynomial, then all are polynomial, and therefore P is equal to NP. Okay? So P is then equal to NP. So P equals NP. That's, the, the, as I said, P versus NP. So P versus NP means the question, is P equal to NP? So if some of this is true, then we have this. Then P is NP. Now that is, um, when we, I will come back to this when we do cryptography, uh, actually bad news. Because if that is possible, then a lot of problems that we think are intractable, because, like, for instance, um, satisfiability, because why do we think it's intractable? Because the only algorithms at the moment we have, after several decades, or perhaps almost a century, of computer science and, and thinking about these things, the best thing we can do is all only exponential time. However, we know it's NP, because we know how to check it in polynomial time, so if P is NP, then it becomes a polynomial time, because, oh, I should have said this, this is not something I can explain, but this particular problem is one of these guys that is considered to be, it's called an NP-complete problem. So, it is one of these, if you want, these are the crucial ones. These are, if you can prove any of those, then you have solved the whole problem. Instead of, okay, right, here, this is about, is this, what does this say? This is, this says that every non-deterministic polynomial time problem is actually polynomial time. It looks like an enormous task to, to carry out because every single time somebody comes up with a non-deterministic polynomial time problem, you have to then show that it's polynomial. No. You only have to show one of these special problems, the so-called NP-complete problems, and here is one. So this isn't NP-complete, so let me make this clear. This is NP-complete. No, that's not, that's not legible. This is NP-complete. So in other words, if you can find an algorithm for satisfiability that solves it in polynomial time, not checking, now we know we can do that. If we can solve it in polynomial time, then not only can you solve that in polynomial, but everything that's in this list, and in fact, everything that is non-deterministic polynomial time. And we will see later that many cryptographies are based on intractable problems, as far as we know, because they're exponential. At the moment, we have nothing better than exponential. But, unfortunately, they're all, or almost all, are NP. They are non-deterministic polynomial, uh, non polynomial time um, check. You can check in non-deterministic polynomial time. And remember, when I was talking about cryptography, I said, what cryptography wants to do is, it wants to present, an in, present you with an intractable problem that is impossible to crack, Unless you have a special information, then it becomes tractable. And that's exactly what where we need these problems to be NP. Because this extra extra uh, information is exactly a solution or part of the solution. I mean, it's a little bit more subtle than that, but it comes boils down to that problem. I hope you can follow a little bit the, the arguments that I'm trying to make. Now, at the moment, we have about 3,000 uh, problems that we know to be NP-complete. So anyone in that list, if that can be done in polynomial time, 
everything can be done in programmable time. And worse, we know how to do it. And therefore, we can crack all these crypto systems that are based on NP problems that are presumed to be intractable because at the moment we only have polynomial time. Okay, so you could think of this as um, as so if we in our barrier here, so we we could think of where does NP NP lie? So NP problems, well, the NP problems lie somewhere here. So these are the NP problems. Uh, why well, does a little bit? Let me call it. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me get rid of this NP here. So these are the NP problems. Okay, but I mean, sorry, I don't mean to say. In the, don't look at this particular. Sorry, let me make this over again. Okay, so let me draw. Let me draw this a little bit better. Okay, so these are considered all the problems that we can deal with, and then there's the big dividing line that I said. This is we have here the tractable ones, and here are the intractable intractable ones. And this means this means exponential, and this means polynomial. So let me just call it P here, okay. And then here is a bunch of problems that are called NP. Not all problems are NP, by the way. There are problems that are exponential and really exponential. They cannot be checked in in polynomial time either. <coughs> and then inside of them is an even smaller collection. Here are these ones. These are the NP complete. Okay, and okay, what is now the, the problem is, and so I have to redraw this, this border here, is that we actually don't know where this lie. So, is it this way or is it this way? Right? That's if P is NP, P is NP says, okay, so uh, this is P and NP. If this is the P and P case. P equals NP, that means all these NP problems that we think might be intractable, at the moment are at least are, are actually tractable, are actually polynomial. So that's the P and P situation. In the in the other situation, so if, if this is not equal, what happens then? Well, then the dividing line is just at the other side, right? So that, that means the dividing line. So we have the big group here, and then the dividing line is this way. So the whole thing is, where does this bunch of problems, this, this cluster of problems, very well known and very well studied problems, especially those in, in here, the ones that are sitting like waiting to jump over the fence, so almost to speak, right? Can they escape? That's the problem, right? Can we escape to the good side, the polynomial side, the tractable side? Think of it that as PNP. And, as I said, many of uh, cryptography uses these NP problems, and if they happen to jump to the other side, WOM! End of story because everybody can now crack it. Because I, I tried to explain this to you that if you can solve one MP complete problem, you have an algorithm for every single of these other ones. In, also for the one that you are trying to. And here is a, a typical one that is called, uh, that is used. It's used more uh, the problem of prime factorization, of composition. So I, what, what, what I have is I have a huge number n, and I, the question is, can I write it as a... So let me not call it prime factor, just call it factorization. It's it better, factorization problem. Is n a product of two numbers? Is n composite? Or is n prime? No, sorry, 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 no, no, that's not, no, no, sorry, I, I have to be more careful here. Find, so it's, it's not just a is, because that is actually, can be done, but the cover is find, a, write n as a non-trivial product, with a and b are not equal to n, if possible, okay, but we can, we, so in other words, n is not a prime, We'll talk about prime numbers before, but remember, if n is not a prime, that means it, it, it can be factored. Well, given such a number, give me the factors of that number. Factor the number for me. So that's the factorization problem. This is, at the moment, in the size of n, logarithmic. Uh, uh, so, so, sorry, exponential, exponential. So, at the moment, this is uh, exponential time. We have nothing better than exponential time, but it is np-complete. 
Now that I cannot. That is really serious mathematics or computer. It's yeah, theoretical uh, computer science. That I cannot explain why it's NP complete, but I can explain to you why it's NP. Can I check if you give me a solution? How much time does it take me to check whether the solution is correct? <laughs> Nothing. You give me A and B, and what I have to do is multiply them and check whether we get M. So solving it is extremely simple. Now you might say, okay, professor, that's just stupid, right? Like, for instance, 15, yes, I can factor that, 3 times 5. Yeah, but we're not talking about 15. We're talking about numbers. And typically, in cryptography, the numbers that one uses are numbers that have actually exactly one factorization. In other words, they are product of what is so-called two large prime numbers. So you have like a big prime number of 10 digits and another big prime number of 10 digits. You multiply together. That number can only be factored in one non-trivial way, namely by these two prime factors. So there's only one solution, and that makes it so hard to find, of course. That's why it's so hard to find that thing, and it's so, at the moment it is O and 2, but it is NP complete because if I give you the two factors, you just multiply and you see, yep, it's true. They are equal. It is, it, I mean, it's the factorization. So that's uh, where we stand. Now, you can now hopefully see that why in the literature, in, the, in popular mo movies, I've seen episodes of Law and Order that, that talk about PMP, almost everything that somehow is cybersecurity and so on, at some point brings in P equals NP because it's like, you know, we all, they all know it's a big, big juicy thing. And in fact, there's a cash prize for $1 million by the Clay Institute uh, as, as one of the seven or six, I forget now how many, there are some of them, one of them is solved in the meantime. So they, the Clay Institute is a mathematical institute, a non-profit organization that has um, a prize for seven or six, forget now exactly how many uh, problems there are that still unsolved in mathematics. And they are considered very important problems because they have a lot of implications. And somehow the most, perhaps the most well-known is this particular one. Because if you can solve it, there are two solutions you can do. Either you solve it by showing that P is NP, and then an avalanche of, of despair and, 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 and everybody, oh my God, oh my God, everything is, all our cryptography is, in, 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 is broken. Everything, all the, because remember, solving P equals NP, the only way you can basically do it is <coughs> by solving, showing that one of these NP complete problems is polynomial time, but once you know how to do one, you know how to do all 3,000 of it and every every NP problem, in particular the one that the cryptographer was using. Okay, now, there's another possibility, namely, and that's the possibility that nowadays is more and more uh, assumed. So, P equals NP, that was original hope, but more and more people are leaning to the fact that P, sorry, let me not do it that way, that P is not NP. So the ex expectation is that P is not equal to NP, which means a big sigh of relief for everybody that was uh, using these NP problems because we now not only do have no good solution, so way of cracking it, it's at the moment exponential, but it will never be better than exponential. Or at least there might be faster algorithms. Be, be careful. It doesn't mean that it cannot be a, a, that somebody comes up with a very clever trick that can actually solve it, but it may, may take much, much longer time. It will be not polynomial time. Okay? And, and I hope that you still are somehow keeping this in mind, why this is such an enormous dividing line between polynomial time and exponential time, because even of size 100, it becomes intractable, whereas size a million is still nothing. Okay? So that's uh, all I wanted to say about um, NP and P. There's, of course tons and tons of things to say about it. It's a very fascinating subject. And um, I, um, I'm trying to remember, but I forgot something to say. Oh, perhaps history, historically, um, this uh, it's, it's rather recent. This is some things from the, in the early 70s, I think, this was done by Cook and Levin. And in fact, they showed that the satisfiability, where's my satisfiability thing? This was the first problem that they, this one, I remember I said this NP, well, it's not legible anymore, let me rewrite this here. This is an NP, they actually showed that it's NP complete. 
I cannot show you that, I cannot explain that to you, because, as like I said, it's a deep theorem, and it was the first NP-complete theorem that one ever has discovered. Even the idea that such a thing existed, NP-complete, I mean, NP-complete is basically, if you break this one, you break everything. That's kind of strange, right? That there is one problem, and about, and this has nothing to do, keep in mind that the one that I was discussing at the end with cryptography is about factor, factoring a number into two, comp, two uh, smaller numbers. That is a big, that can be broken in polynomial time if you can do this one, which has nothing to do with numbers. It's about truth of, of, of propositional statements. So you, you see that mathematics sometimes can make very change, sorry, very strange twists and turns that you would not expect, and they are there, and it makes it such a fascinating uh, topic. Okay, I'm going to stop here, and I hope that you um, learned a little bit about it. But as I said, this is more abstract than theoretical. We, we, I'm not going to do that many homework problems, and also no quiz on this.